Hello again, folks. Um, today is Friday, um, the 9th of October. And as promised, I'm going to review the test that I had messaged to you on Wednesday. Okay, as I mentioned, you, you don't have to send anything. I'm just giving you the credit for it. Uh, reason being, I haven't really figured out how I could proctor this legitimately, um, remotely. Uh, this doesn't seem possible to me anyhow, so I'm not counting that against you. I'm just going to give you the points. Um, I, having said that, I would appreciate it if you would try for the test because um, it's uh, for the sake of experience, which is really more important than anything else anyway. Um, this is what it looks like. All right. It's 20 questions. I originally thought it was going to do 10 or 12, but it didn't seem quite thorough enough, so I made it a full 20 questions, which is more or less normal. Uh, there's an attachment to it. This is a key for uh, different numeral systems. Right, you can see that we have traditional Chinese here. Uh, this is the standard Hindu Arabic numeral system. Above is the Roman numerals and uh, ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics. Who would have thought that that would be part of math, right? Um, it's interesting. Anyhow, we'll be doing test number one today. I right, just a review of this, and I was so happy that I, I, I put it in fancy braces, you know, as if it was in set notation. Uh, so I'm uh, just living the wildlife. Um, anyhow, let me uh, go over uh, this using whatever keys we have. Glasses on, and we'll get started. Okay. Right. Um, what I might do, maybe just I'll do this first. Probably should have done this off camera, but uh, I'll just give you the solutions first, and then I'll go through each problem how you do it. Right. Let's see. Hopefully, my markers are going to cooperate today. They're about due for replacements. That's just how they are. the solutions. If you know, if you've been doing the homework, and again, that, that is the most important thing. Um, I took some of the questions from the homework because I felt that, wow, those were really challenging, whatever uh, examples they were. So they're included on this, and if you were struggling with it, here's your opportunity to uh, see how it would work. Okay. These are the solutions, all right, in the order that they would occur. Uh, the first is 3,067, 620, 24,322, 68, and they'll do that. Uh, five is 79,378. Let me make sure that this is visible. Looks like it's okay. How about that? The light might be better. Okay. Number six. Uh, 12,546 in base 8. That's what the subscript 8 is here. Okay, 378. That's a 7, I swear. Uh, da, da, da. Let's see. Number 7 is 60,129 in base 10. 8 is 1521 in base 7. Uh, binary number nine is zero zero one zero two, right. and number ten 
15. Uh, number 12 has two parts. It's $150 and $26.50. All right, uh, 13 is the sales. I'm just going to abbreviate S. would have to be greater than $4,100. 14 is the slope is equal to negative 7 over 15. Uh, 15 is a little bit hard, so I'll just sort of sketch it really quick. Because it's a, it's a diagram. The slope, when you were calculating or rearranging, would have been negative one quarter. And the y-intercept B would have been zero, negative two. So you would have instinctively gone down to negative two at this point. And then if it's negative one, it would be one down over four to the right. So from that point, you go down one and then count one, two, three, four. And you'd have roughly, uh, roughly something that looks like this. Okay, this is a grid naturally on a test, but that's 15. Right. 16 is the coordinate. Would it pair one comma seven? It's a seven. Uh, 18 is the variable V is either negative three fourths or positive one eighth. So those two. 18 is, now I'm doing it backwards, sorry, that's 18. Uh, brother. That's number 18. I'm not getting enough coffee in my diet here. Okay, 17, I'm sorry, is 280 pounds of soy and 80 pounds of corn. It's really soy meal and corn meal. 18 is uh, what I just mentioned, but erased. Negative three quarters and one eighth. Uh, I think I'm kind of tucking myself into a corner here, so I'll put 19, this is 15. 19 is x is equal to 6 and negative 3. And number 20 is not a function. Okay, my blue is fading out, so that's not good. Right. Why is it not a function? Because it fails the vertical line test. Okay, I hope that's visible. Like I said, this is an overview if you just wanted to know what the solutions were for sure. Um, and now I'm going to discuss each one of them intricately. Let's see if I got a better blue. That's much better. Okay. okay. Um, in order to do the first three, all right, um, it would be good to have, as I, I attached it, um, the table of different numeral systems. It's a little faded, my copy, but yours should be crisp, uh, at least if you have a nice printer. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, one is an additive, which is an example of an additive, one is an example of a multiplicative, and another is an example of ciphered. Uh, let's see. Here. The first one is the ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics. Is that, is that okay? 
it looks like it's good. All right. Using the table, write the Egyptian numeral as a standard Hindu Arabic numeral. Remember, Hindu Arabic numerals are really the numerals that we are familiar with. All right. We just tend not to call them that. English speakers tend to just simply call it Arabic. The reason it's Hindu Arabic is it probably originates from India. It's just that more recently in history, Europeans had gotten it by way of North Africa. Um, all right. Anyway, it's a little tricky. I'm going to draw three crescent moons. <laughs> Sounds silly, right? And some pointing downward arrows here. And uh, Hot. And that to me, although I'm not trying to make, belittle this at all, to me kind of looks like a flower. Right? In fact, you know what I thought of while I was going through is like um, Mario Paint. You know, that old, it was a game that was based, Microsoft Paint and Mario Paint were basically the same software. Uh, but uh, I swear that there was an icon that kind of looked like that. Right? Anyhow, you'd have what appears to be horseshoe shapes, they're called heel, right? which would kind of make sense if you're thinking about this in terms of wet sand. Right? You know how when you walk on the beach, you leave you know, probably the deepest impression from your body weight um, in the sand on your heel. Right? And that kind of looks like a heel, I suppose. Right? And then there are these lines. So you see this basically on the paper, and your task is to translate this from what it is, ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics, into the Hindu Arabic numeral system, which we're familiar with. All right. um, it's an additive system, which means that you're just literally adding every single one of these things. And you could just keep doing it into infinity. If you meant to subtract something, you would just simply remove one of them, right? That is basically as sophisticated a system as it was in terms of adding and subtracting, right? With all due respect to our ancestors, right? Anyhow, this symbol, the uh, sort of crescent moon with the arrow, and I don't know if it's a circle or not, but to me it looks like a pot, you know? It looks like a flower to me, all right? What does it mean? You look at your reference. I'll pull it out here because I have it loose. You look with your reference and then you go to the key, and it's up here. Heel is 10, 1 is 1, that's intuitive. And the sort of crescent flower here, maybe it's a lotus, um, is uh, a 1,000. So this is literally a 1,000 plus a 1,000 plus a 1,000. And this is 10 plus 10 plus 10 plus 10 plus 10 plus 10. Right. And this is 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. All right. Then you add them all up. All right. Collectively, this is 3,000. This is 60. And this is 7. Right. So if you sort of conform to stacking them in the usual way, remember that you add place values. All right. So they have to be aligned just so, right? 7603. 3067 would be the correct answer or translation. If you're curious, I didn't make this as part of it, but if you wanted to go backward the other way, if you wanted to basically go from Hindu Arabic to Egyptian, which again, you're not, I didn't put it on the test, right? You might start with this to go vice versa. Right. You have your Hindu Arabic numerals, right? right? And you try to translate them into a place value. Right. This is the thousands place for our purpose, the hundreds place, the tens, and the ones. There are three thousands. Zero hundreds, you don't have to worry about it. Six tens and seven ones. You can get rid of the multiplication X if you like. So it's really just an instruction to say, all right, well, if it's three times a thousand, then I really need to make three iterations 
of a thousand. And it would be pluses technically. And then if it's six tens, then it would be ten, 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 ten. And if it's seven ones, it's one, 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 one. And from there, you translate these into the appropriate symbol. It's a little bit out of the frame, so let me lower that slightly. Okay. This one would be crescent moon. Makes you wonder what the ancestors were thinking. Perhaps I'm not interpreting this correctly. Right. But I wonder if this is meant to be an arrow. It does look like a moon to me, so I mean like I mean, our ancestors were, in, you know, obviously concerned with agriculture a lot, so perhaps a certain phase of the moon was relevant. I'm just guessing. Yeah. Heel, 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 heel. Which is not an insult. You're a heel, right? You're a sand impression. You're a hieroglyph, all right? One, 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 one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. This would be the translation, right? which is what it came from. I'll do that for the other ones. Again, I didn't make it the, what you had to do. I just wanted you to do what was practical. Translate something into what we know. Um, as far as a multiplicative system is concerned, of the two, uh, about using traditional Chinese characters, if you were going to convert traditional Chinese characters into the Hindu Arabic system, HA or just called for right now, um, notice that this is for the purposes of multiplication. They're not always in pairs. But I would start with thinking of them that way. Okay. So in our case, and I, it's a little bit tricky, right? I'm going to attempt using these implements, right? to draw traditional Chinese characters. I really should probably be using an implement that would have been used, or even maybe is still used, right? It's traditional, still in use, all right? Um, I hope I do this justice, you know? A brush stroke like that, then down, and then mark this way, and mark this way. And something like that. Perhaps a little bit better. One thing I think that's interesting as you're looking at and you're comparing the, um, the numeral systems is that the one thing that seems to be consistently the same, at least across through several of them, the one exception would be Ionic Greek, right? Is the numeral one. Right? In ancient Egyptian, the numeral one is pretty much the same shape. In a Roman numeral, right, it's an I, which is still the sh same shape as an Arabic, Indo-Arabic numeral. In ancient Chinese, it's a brush stroke, but it's sideways, right? At least compared to what we're used to, right? It's stacked, which maybe makes more sense. 
right? The, the one thing that's defiant here is Ionic Greek. They've associated with the letter Alpha. It's the first letter, right? Um, in Babylonian, it's a wedge that looks like a one, right? In Mayan, right, it's a single dot, right? Anyhow, it's intuitive, right? I would say it's like a finger. It's simulating. Right. Now, as I said, traditional Chinese characters for the sake of multiplication, all right, you might start thinking of them as pairs, all right? They're not always that way. I left out one, didn't I? No, nope, they're there. Okay. So, here's two, and here's two. All right. The top is usually uh, one through nine. Right. And the thing immediately underneath it is a power of ten. that you multiply by, okay? So you're gonna decide what this symbol is and it's gonna be times whatever that power of 10, all right? Same thing here since there happens to be two of them. You're gonna figure out what this is and multiply it by its power of 10. So you go to your diagram and you look for this character. And let me see, what do we most closely resemble? Six, which is my favorite number. All right, so this is really six times the power of 10. This is intuitively two. Why is that? Why is that? And I probably didn't draw it nicely, but um, it's two fingers, right? Just this orientation versus this orientation. Right. Um, as for the powers of 10, uh, this symbol, all right, is, well, oh, I didn't draw it that well, a hundred. So that would be technically two, right, which is the same thing as saying a hundred. So it's six times a hundred. Right? And this symbol is, I'm looking at it wrong, ten. Which is 10 to the first. Right. So it's 2 times 10. Right. You figure out what the products are individually and then you combine them. Same to you! 600, there's a whole one outside. Right. 2 times 10 is 20. Again, in our system, we would lock up the, uh, the place values right. and then it them as such. 620. The black is fading out. Okay. Let's see if this one's done. Okay. That's going the, the way that the question was asked. If you were going to go backwards, right, that is, if you were going, starting from Hindu Arabic and you were going backward to traditional Chinese, let me just walk you through that. And this is vice versa. Another funny blue. That stinks. I gotta get this button now because I keep buying them, but they don't last. Yeah. Um, basically, you want to try to break into place values. Wow, that is bad. That is atrocious, actually. I'll be right back. I gotta throw this out. Sometimes if you don't use them for a, a while, then all of a sudden they recover. Yeah. Yeah. Into place values. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, if you start with the number 620, and it's still fading. If you 
start with the number 620. All right. It's a six in the hundreds place, so we'll just start with 600. And two in the, in the, in the tens place, so it's 20. All right. So then you could basically factor this as six times 100. And this is two times 10. And then translate them into the character that relates to that. Again, you would have, at least if you have, haven't just memorized, and I apologize, I don't. All right. um, you go to your list all right, and see what six translates to this symbol here. It looks almost like a star. Sometimes there isn't, all right? Sometimes it's just a single number that's one through nine. So like as if you had a number in the ones place. Right? If you had a zero in between, it didn't happen in this case, but a zero in the end. But if you had a zero in between, non-zeros, all right, just use the symbol For zero. That is to say, you don't need to have a multiplier, right? right. No multiplier. Right. You don't have to do times whatever the um, the place value. There's no power of ten. It's like zero times the power of ten. It's unnecessary. In fact, if there's double zeros, you don't even need to use zero zero. You just use one of them. Use a symbol for zero. Right. Okay. doesn't write very well, but it's tenacious. Won't <laughs> go away. <laughs> Unless it's new. If it's a brand new marker, it's great. It's an old cheesy marker. It takes forever to get lost. It's around for It's like a bad date. Anyway. Um, now we'll discuss number three. The ciphered system. Okay, this is using ancient, uh, pardon me, Ionic Greek. It is ancient Greek, uh, but uh, a simplified form. That's even feasible. Um, the ancient Greek system, although it, it's, I wouldn't call it difficult, it's, except that if you were going to employ this, you'd have a lot to memorize. The advantage of the other systems is that. Um, they're, you know, more finite, everything is finite, but there, there's less characters to memorize, right? That may encumber the operations involved, right? Like Babylonian, as you know, there's only two characters, but it uh, doesn't mean that you could do sophisticated math with it, you know? And, you know, cyphermating is fractionated. In the ciphered system, let me duplicate what, the way it looks first. Here's three. Um, there is this symbol that is in superscript known as iota. 
and that means times a thousand. Okay, so if you see iota and then you see what appears to be a kappa, I'm just going to cheat and kind of use the Romanesque style here, and then another iota, and you see Greek delta, and then tau, and then another kappa. I wish I could give it a little, a little more flair, you know? Maybe we got something like that. Stepping out with my kappa. Here we go. Stepping out with my kappa. Do -do 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 -do. And this is the beta. Okay. All right. <laughs> Looks like some ancient, uh, ancient Greek curse word, you know? Um, it's a number though. All right. So, um, you would associate the superscript with the, essentially the numeral next to it, right? and then this would be separate from that, and both of these things each would be uh, times a thousand. Okay. And let's just maybe put them in parentheses. Plus, that's here and here. So we're out what that is. Count that we can put in two places, and data we can put on the end. Okay. So again, you go to your table. Unless you have it memorized, and good for you if you did. Kappa, which is here, is twenty. So this is 20 times 1,000, which is clearly 20,000. And I'll put a 20 here as well. Delta, I'm looking at this backwards there. Delta is 4. So 4 times 1,000 is 4,000. Tau. Let me see what tau is. To look at it in this orientation, let's see. Mm, tricky. Oh, it's alphabetical, stupid. What are you thinking? Right. 300. There it is. 300, tau. 20 and beta is 2. Okay. So you would just add them. And not speak so much when you do it. In traditional um, math around here, right, we would do it this way, right? Lock up all of the places. This is why I say graph paper is essential if you go into um, elementary education. Not to digress, but as I've mentioned in the past, they give special paper to kids when they're teaching them how to make letters, right? They should give special paper to kids when they're trying to learn how to add and subtract. And that special paper is graph paper, where you could very ill or attentively line up, you know, the digits. It's given them a scaffold. That's my feeling. But I digress. Two, two, three, four, two. 24,322. Just for the sake of discussing it both ways, let's try that. Uh, let's see. If you were going to go vice versa, okay. Let's talk about maybe breaking into add-ins. technically be add-ons, but it's place values. Okay. okay. So, in this number, 24,322, we would have 20,000, and we would have 4,000, and we would have 300, and we would have 20, and we would have 2. 
right? and for those things that are greater than a thousand I'll just say a number greater than a thousand use iota in superscript okay so there's two things that are like that this is really four times a thousand and this is really 20 times a thousand so it would be whatever 20 with an iota is whatever four with an iota all right what is 20 it's kappa what is four it's delta See if that's in the frame. What is 300? There's a character for that, tau. What is 20? It's cap again. What is two? Beta. Okay. schedule to clean this eraser once a week because it works better when it's clean. Okay. <clears throat> right. Number four and number five are the positional value systems. Uh, pardon me, positional numeral systems, otherwise known as place value systems. And number four is, I'm going to put this here like this, um, translating from Babylonian <laughs> this, <now. laughs> this is stupid, but I always think of Ghostbusters. Um, and I, I swear I haven't been able to find it, but there's a line in the movie where they're talking about Gozer the Gozerian, which is an ancient god, right? And somebody, missed, I think it was Winston, he mistakenly referred to it, you know, as anybody would, to a, a Babylonian god. And then someone goes, no, no, um, uh, not Babylonian, uh, Mesopotamian, you know, maybe in general, or Sumerian, that was it, Sumerian. <laughs> so again... I don't, I don't want to be smited by the ancestors, right? You know, it's important to all of us, you know? <laughs> but whenever I find myself writing in ancient Babylonian, I kind of scratch my head and go, how did I get here? I like it. It's fascinating, but it's just never something I predicted. <laughs> Somehow the state of New Jersey thinks that it's important, so good. Now, um, just as a scaffold, I made you a handout a while ago, and I want to refer to it. Um, is he going to use this a couple of times? There is this handout for converting from the familiar system to, and for lack of a nicer expression, what would be alien to us, the people who use Hindu-Arabic system, okay? This is sort of a procedure for that, all right? and a table also of some powers of 10 and other base systems. And this, which is probably more important right now, the alien system, that is Babylonian to us, modern humans, going to the familiar system, which is Hindu Arabic, right? This is the procedure for that, okay? Have that on hand, at least if you find it useful, all right? Let me give you a model. I'm just gonna sort of write it up here for reference. There's a model that will employ in one way or another. If we're talking Babylonian, 
Then we're going to figure out what the group represents, and it's going to be times a power of 60. Um, and there may be several of these. So a group value times a power of 60. Babylonian is based upon 60 rather than on 10. It's sexagesimal is the phrase that I find funny to say too, because I'm a jerk. Sexagesimal, right? <laughs> All right, yes. Math, who knew, All right? Ancient Babylonian math. All right, cool. All right, so anyhow, base 60. I'm putting a little question mark here because depending upon how many groups you have, you may, you may need several uh, 60s, right? And you always start with zero, and then you go to 60 to the first, 60 to the second, and you read right to left. It's a little counterintuitive, perhaps, okay? 60, anything to zero, incidentally, is gonna be one, okay? with the exception of zero itself. But anyhow, I would start with writing something like that. Even though that's the end result, I would nonetheless, for the sake of clarity, encourage you to write 60 to the zero, even if you know what it's going to become, even if it's eight to the zero, even if it's seven to the zero, All right? Because it, it, it kind of establishes, it sets the tone, you know? It makes a pattern for you. All right, now I have to duplicate um, the symbols as you see them. In this question, you have a wedge, and there is left an, an obvious gap. Right? And then there's sort of the wedge that looks like a boomerang. Think of, again, the, the tools that the ancestors had, right? They had, our ancestors had, you know, a stick, you know, basically. So, their system of writing in Babylonian would probably be the earliest system, right? It was not too complicated, right? It's what the stick could do, a reed chopped, you know? You can press a reed into clay in two ways and make a boomerang, sort of. It's not cling on, I swear. This looks like Virgil Eczema. Eczema's Flukerang, alright? A flukerang is a, an acronym for forward looking uh, uh, something else, boomerang, alright? Kind of looks like a flukerang. Right. Anyhow. Vampire ish, too. Okay. Now, remember, you have the table, of course, as a reference down here. There are exactly two numbers in the system 10 and 1. You know, 10 and 1, I should say. All right. Then there's this thing. All right. This symbol means subtract. All right. If it's more efficient, and there is a little room, a leeway here for probably doing it more than one way. But if it's more efficient to write a subtraction rather than addition, that would be uh, a better course, right? You'd, you'd end up having to make less impressions in clay, right? So let's see what we have here. We have basically this is one group. And this would be the second group, even though it's just lonely, right? And if we're starting from zero, as we always should, right? Then our first position here is going to be times 60. And then you go right to left, and you'll have just 60 to the first. So let's figure out what the groups are. Right. This one is just a, a symbol for one. So the group is really just one times 60, which you could just say is 60, fading out. That's a wee bit better. 
This one over here is a subtraction problem because of this sort of flukerang-esque looking symbol here. Right? It's just a derivative of the other wedges, right? But if it's sitting above this symbol, right, this means essentially subtract. In tandem, I should say. So, what is a boomerang? A boomerang is essentially 10. If this means subtract in tandem, and let's just put a minus here, and if you see two digits here, um, then this is two. Then it really is just a matter of eight minus two, pardon me, 10 minus two, which is eight, times 60 to the zero. 60 to the zero is just one, so what's eight times one? What's eight times one? Eight. What's 60 times eight? 68. Okay. Uh, if you had to write this, make obvious gaps like this, okay, that will establish one group separate from a second group. Okay. And again, always start with zero for your base, uh, for your exponents of the, one of the bases, and then go, strangely, at least to us, right to left. All right. If you were going the other way, again, you're not responsible for this, but if you're curious, let me just show you. Okay, that's terrible. That's not much better. Uh, I'm gonna throw all these markers out. Um, if you're going from Hindu Arabic to Babylonian. That's what this piece of paper that I'm referring to was. Okay. If you're going to start from an alien system, let's just say a Babylonian is kind of alien looking, all right, and go to the familiar system, start with this. Identify the character set, all right. The character set would be you have two characters, you got that symbol. And that's it, right? That's all you have to work with, right? And then identify the base of that system. The base is 60. So it would be 60 to the zero, 60 to the first, 60 to the second, 60 to the third. You may not need that many, but at least identify it, all right? Know that this is really one, this is really 60, this is really 3,600, and this is whatever that is, 7,200 grams, right? Uh, I forget, what is it, what hand? 60 to the third, whoa, way off hand, 216,000, okay? You're not gonna need that many, right? The second thing is, identify, the number of digits, right? Right. The number of digits that we have, right? Um, the other way. This way. Sorry. Start with this. We're going from the familiar system to alien. Sorry. Okay. I would still collect this information if we need it anyway. Right. You're going to basically take your 68, uh, for crying out loud, and it just work. Mm -hmm. Take your 68, right, and compare it to these choices. You want to identify what is it less than. Well, it would be less than 3,600, right? And once you have established that, what that means is divide by the next lowest, the next power of 60. Right. So if you have 68 and you divide by 60, right. how many 60s can you squeeze into 68? One, which would be a difference of eight. Save this symbol. Then divide until you run out of powers, right? And the remainder. Right? So you have eight now. 
The next power after 60 is 1. So you're going to divide 8 by 1, even if that sounds silly, and you would get uh, 8. Okay. Now, these are the numerals that they would translate to in a base 60 system. But these are the character set that we have to work with. And we know that there is one other thing that we can do in Babylonian, which is subtraction. As long as we employ these two in tandem, this means subtract. So if we want to get to 8, think about how we would get to 8. In theory, and this may be an option really, we could add to get to 8. work, meaning what would be less characters? Probably subtraction. I mean, in theory, if I took this digit of 1 here, then that's just this wedge. But if I wanted to take 8, it would have to be either 10 minus 2, because we only have a boomerang to choose from and another symbol. Or, in theory, it would have to be a lot of adding. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. This 10 is a boomerang, and this 2 is two more wedges. And here's the thing, you might say, well, why don't I just go with this, all right? Because it would intuitively, at least to a Babylonian, right? This would be adding, right? Without the extra little symbol. Again, it's not called a fluke orang, it just looks like a fluke orang. That's a word, I swear, all right? All right? And if you did it this way, you'd have a lot more characters, little teeth here, to have to draw, which is not really efficient. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Didn't make that one. Okay. So, if you did one left a huge gap and then put a bunch of these, I guess technically that would be correct. But you might be considered a lousy scribe because you're wasting clay. All right. Imagine how many times people have said that to me. You're wasting paper. Oh God. You should recycle paper, right? Yes. Yeah, spare the farts, but uh, nonetheless, you're doing your work. So anyhow, going off on a tangent. All right. Don't waste clay. All right. How do you avoid wasting clay? You subtract. All right, 10 minus 2, okay. as opposed to 1 plus 8, apart from uh, 1 and the, so this is really 60, right? 60 plus 8. This is 60, this is 8, right? Because of its position, right? All right. All right. Stumble through that, okay. One more of these slow, painful things, and then we'll pick up the pace. Right. I'm an hour in here. Okay, is that clear? 
clean enough? It seems all right. All right, the next one was Mayan. All right, Mayan, like traditional Chinese, is stacked. This is a uh, problem five. And you see, I like these symbols very much. To me, they're super intuitive. All right. This is a not quite a quasi, shall we say, base 20 system. Right. And the reason that I say quasi is because it's not quite accurate to say it that way. I'm not even sure if I spelled quasi correctly, but I believe I did. The system would be whatever your sum or group is. Um, and you're again reading from right to left. It would start with 20 to the zero, right? Times whatever the group sum is. And then it would be 20 to the first times whatever the sum is. This is a model, right? But then after that, it's going to be um, 18 times 20 to the first times whatever your sum is. It just introduces 18. And then next after 20 is 20 squared, still times 18, times whatever your sum is. I'm running out of space, right? You could, as a favor to yourself, figure out what this would translate to in regular numbers. 20 to the first is just one, so you get to multiply by one, right? Uh, 20 to the zero is one. 20 to the first is just 20. 20 times 18, that's a cheap use of calculator. All right, 20 times 18, there's a syntax error because I put too many things in there. 360, and then it could get out of control really quick. You have 400 times 18, which is 7,200. You may need in some certain problems to figure out what these uh, multipliers would be. Right. Factors is more correct, right? Anyhow, if it were truly a base 20 system, there wouldn't be 18 suddenly showing up here, right? But Mayan math required that somehow, so, and they are famous for their calendars, so kudos to them. The ancestors did something cool. I, I really, this is weeded, I, I have to say this, but I really am taken with the very intuitive way that the numerals look, right? This is the one thing that, well, aside from Greek, that doesn't use a line to simulate a finger, they use dots to simulate a number, right? And it's dots up to four, right? And then five is a line, so two lines would be naturally 10 and three lines would be 15, all right? It's very intuitive, all right? Even glancing at it for a moment, you go, oh, I know what that is, all right? So they're stacked. There's going to be, <clears throat> in this case, two lines and a dot. This symbol, which to me kind of looks like a coin on its edge, is zero, all right? Three dots. And a line, and then three dots, and three lines. And it's a little faint, but I think you could see that. Um, I'm going to keep these in my cup because at least if they are down, they might be a little more forgiving for the time being in terms of actually writing. Okay, so in this case, these positional values here, I'm gonna put little dashes in between them. Right. These character groups, if you will, are the positional values. The bottom is the first. Right. And the top is the last. Right. Whatever you figure the character is, you're going to start from here. This would be the bottom multiplier, and however many you need. 
if there are four character positions, then you're going to need four uh, base 20s, or kind of base 20s, this is the 18. Right? Which means, let's figure out what this is. If a line is five, right, which is intuitive us to us humans, right, because of a uh, hand, all right, it's five, all right, the number, the amount, I mean. Then three lines is 15 plus three dots, and a dot is a one, basically. So this would be 18 right off the bat. We're gonna multiply that by the first uh, power of 20, which is really just one, okay? Yeah. This is a line, which is the amount of five plus three dots, which is five plus three, which is eight. This is gonna be eight times the next one, so it's just really times 20. All right, this is a zero. Zero times 360, since that's the third one. All right, and then this is five and 10 plus one is 11. 11 times, even going this far apparently, 7,200. Okay. So, we do the, the calculation here and add them up, all right? 18 times one is obviously 18. Eight times 20 is 160. I'm trying to desperately to align these so it's a little bit easier to add. Zero times 360 is just zero, so you don't have to worry. All right. 11 times 720 is 79,200, yike. Let me just verify that. Yeah. 72,000, pardon me, 79,200. Okay. All right. So, you add them up. Eight, uh, zero, zero again, six and one is seven. Uh, two and one is three, and that should be nine, and then seven. So in the end, you should have seventy-nine thousand three hundred. If I just drew that a little bit sharper, all right? Uh, seventy-eight. That is a seven, I swear. Okay. If you're gonna go the other way, again, you weren't responsible for this, and not to belabor the point. But the reason that um, I keep trying to show you backwards and forwards is because you already know what the answer is, so that helps to have that reference, all right? When we do base 10 into some other base that's not, you know, ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics, all right? It helps to have a frame of reference, you know? I should say Babylonian in particular, because it's the positional value systems that we're gonna kind of borrow a technique from. All right. In this case, all right, if you were going vice versa, And you would do Babylonian as you would, in the same method as you would uh, Mayan, right? Identify, you know, the character set. It would take too long for me to write it, so. Here, of course, is the character set, right? Um, you know, dot, 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 dot line. One, two, three, four, five, and so forth. Yeah. The positional values, all right. it's 20 to the zero, 20 to the one, 20 to the one times 18, 20 squared times 18, and so forth. All right. I'm gonna do one more, um, just for the sake of reference, because I think I'm gonna need it. Um, it would technically be 20 cubed times 18. This is really 20 to the zero is one, 20 to the first is just 20. 
This is, um, what was it? I just broke it. 360, right? And this is that enormous number, 720, pardon me, 7,200. This one is going to be very large. Right. Let's see. All right, 20 to the third is 8,000 by itself times 18. It is, wow, 144,000. Okay, now if we're going through this process, all right, I'm gonna erase everything just not to get distracted. I'm gonna need the space. I'm gonna convert 79,378 into Mayan. Right. I would go through these two steps, transitioning either way, you know, from Mayan to a number or from this number to Mayan, especially now. All right. All right. Let's look at our number here. This number, 79,378, is less than what? Of these choices. It's less than 144,000. So what we're gonna do is instead divide by the next power. Right, it's really the next factor. Right? The next one, which would be 7,200. This is a little bit painstaking, right? Because of the division involved. But if you did 79,378 times 7,200, right? You're not going to fit it in seven. You're not going to fit it in 79 or 793, but you will fit it into 7,937. You could use your calculator. There's no sin in that. But you could also estimate. This would be approximately one, right? You do have to, unfortunately, do the intricate sort of long division here because you need to establish what the remainder would be. This would be seven and three and seven and you bring down eight and you go, okay, how many 7200s can I squeeze into 73? Again, one, right? 7200, this would be an eight, a seven and a one. That's your remainder because you're not doing decimal division. And then you continue. Save this, 178, you're now gonna divide by the next one. If it works, all right? And you're gonna see it's not gonna work, but you still explore the option. And you go, 360, will that fit into 178? How many times? Zero, all right? We need it just to establish the place. So you're gonna save that even if it seems silly. And then you go, all right, well, what do I gotta do? I gotta go to the next one then. 178 times the next one would be 20. And you can do that, right? 20 goes in, now it won't fit in 17, but it will fit into 178 close, right? Six times, which would be 160, and the difference would be 18, right? You need to go through the intricate moving division, even if you use a calculator to establish part of the quotient, that's cool, right? But uh, do the long division to get the remainder. 18. And then you do the last one here, which is dividing by 1. 18, uh, pardon me, 1 goes into 1 once, it goes into 18 8 times. These quotients these quotients translate into Mayan or whatever the character set is, right? You have four positions, basically. So you gotta go, it's gonna be 11, sitting on top of zero, sitting on top of six, sitting on top of 18. You don't have to really worry about the, uh, the powers now, you've already done that work. Right. You just got to get the character set translation for these, right? So 11 is 
two fives, which is 10, and a dot. And that's very faint. Zero is that sort of coin. All right. Six is five. Pardon me, there's one of them. There's a mistake there. It's eight. It is 160. Sorry. Eight is five and three dots. All right. And 18 is 10. Three, 15. I mean, do this. It's messy. That's five. Come on, work with me, Malka. Ten. Fifteen. This is, I swear, a line. And then three dots. Okay. Ten and one is eleven. That's zero. In this position, that would be times whatever this is. Uh, that one. 360, okay. eight, because it's 20 times eight is 160, not six. And then 18 is 15 plus three dots, okay? It's intricate, all right? And as you can see, even I, as the guy who's even instructed, struggled with it, so don't feel bad, all right? All right? There's a system to it, though, right? It just takes doing it a lot to get to it. Now let's do um, six and seven. And I'll try to speed it up a bit. Basically, the reason that I wanted to take the time with Mayan, and uh, Mayan especially, and um, Babylonian is because the things that you're going to see now, which are just purely numbers, they're not foreign looking characters to us, right? Pretty much it's the same transition process, a lot of comparison to the powers. I really need to clean this. This is, I'm uh, just not to take up too much time here. Um, I'm gonna try to separate out my duds from my good markers. All right, you're gonna translate from number six into Arabic, which is otherwise known as base 10. <laughs> system um, into an octal numeral, which is base eight. Okay. It's still alien, right? We don't use that too often. It's just that it's going to use the more familiar digit symbols, right? I would still establish what a base eight uh, character set would look like. For your own sake. I put it in set notation. So it's going to start with zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, and it will go up to seven. It's always one number shy of one of the bases. Why? Because zero has to be included. Right? And if it's bases of eight, right, then write that out as well. Right? Eight to the zero, eight to the first, eight to the second, eight to the third, right? and so forth. Right? You could figure out what they would translate to. This is one, this is eight, this is 64, and eight to the third. If you look at the table from way back when, I probably wrote this out, but if I didn't, you can at least point to it. If it was a table like this I had given you earlier in the semester. Eight to the third, I didn't actually write the, well I did, 512 apparently, okay. Okay, you may need to go further, Depends on how uh, big a number it is. All right, now in this case, uh, for this problem we have uh, 
of 5,478 to start with. We put a little uh, subscript 10 to indicate that this is base 10, which really means it's the rank of the number that we're familiar with. So you, this is an option, more or less. All right. Now, um, look how large this is in comparison to what these are. Let me just see what 8 to the 4th would be. Now you could take the calculator, hit 8, use the upward pointing carrot, and then type 4, and it will tell you. 4,096, right? I'm gonna go one further because I really want to exceed this for the sake of uh, comparison only. Eight to the fifth is probably gonna be it. Right. You'll see what I'm going after in a minute. Let's see, eight to the fifth. Turn it on. Is thirty-two thousand seven hundred sixty-eight. Yuck. Okay. Thirty-two thousand seven hundred sixty-eight. Okay. Now, here's where it gets interesting. We're going to take the number that we have to work with here and compare it to these. All right. This number, five thousand four hundred seventy-eight is less than, way less than, right? this one, all right? So we're going to use this when we divide. Okay, which means now we have 5,478 divided by 4,096. You'd probably be overshooting it if you use two, so I'm gonna use one. And it's okay if you use your calculator, but you really do need to use the long division to establish what the remainder of this, all right? Because that's how you're gonna continue dividing. Eight minus six is two. This is gonna borrow from here. 17 minus eight is, pardon me, 17 minus nine is eight. Three is zero, and that's one. Okay, so then you take this, and you divide again, the remainder. Um, let's see, what are we gonna use? The next one, 512. Okay, 512, maybe two, three would be overshooting it. So you're gonna use two for sure. Right. And if you do 512 times two, four, two, 1,024, subtract. That's 12, this would be seven. That's, uh, what is it? I'm just struggling with that, eight, duh. Okay, seven minus two is five, and that's a three. 358, okay, and again, do it again, 358. Divided by the next one, 64. 64, you can estimate if this was 300 and that was 60, it'd be 5, so maybe be that. 64 times mm, 5 would be overshooting it, I believe, yes. No, it's good. Okay, 320. Uh, good. 5, 320. 8, 3, 38. Chuchin along here, okay, 38 divided by eight. Eight goes into 38 roughly four times, which is 32, the difference is six. And then at six divided by the last one is one is six. Okay, now, if this was done correctly, the numerals, maybe I should use this in black. The quotients that you get up here, are going to be limited to things in the character set, meaning that you're not going to see a digit in the quotient that isn't one of these, right? Nothing that exceeds seven, ironically, right, because it's base eight, right? And it doesn't, right? It's just one, two, five, four, and six. 
congratulations, you're done. All right. Because apparently, 5,000, no, wait, isn't this right? All right. 5,478 in base 10 equals 12,546 in base 8. This is your answer. Okay. Once you do enough of them, all right, um, get better and better at it naturally, as it is with anything. I know. Again, not to digress, but if you're going into elementary education, you have to con you have to believe it yourself. But you have to convince your students that they can do anything really. Right? People do not believe that. Unfortunately, and society doesn't encourage that, but it's true, right? I, I, you know, how many of us use Babylonian math? <laughs> you know? But somehow, each one of us, right, sat down and went, you know what, today, Babylonian math, all right? And we did it, all right? So, if Corona World has taught me anything, all right, anything is possible, all right? Propagate that, all right? Your kids can handle, and I'm not going to do this stuff, but your students will be able to handle anything. It just is an investment in time, all right? Same for you, same for me, all right? All right, 12,546 in base eight. Let's do the next one. How'd you learn how to ride a bicycle? You fell off the damn bike 800 times, probably. I didn't learn how to ride my bike until I was eight, uh, which was shameful, at least in my family, because my older sister and my brother had learned much earlier than that, I'm sure. Right. But eventually I got over my fear, you know, and my mother was patient with me. This is also very important when you're a teacher. You have to be patient with your students, right? You are the living embodiment of whatever subject you teach. So don't be a goblin. <laughs> you don't want to scare people away. All right. This one is, I, I like this one a lot, actually. Let me show you this. All right. Here's seven. Ugh. You. Number seven is this funky thing. I'm gonna really stylize that one so I don't want you to think it's an I. This is an Arabic, Hindu Arabic numeral one. And yeah, believe it or not, those are letters there. <laughs> How come, all right? Because in a base, if you're gonna translate what is basically, basically waka waka, a base 16 numeral, that's this, into Hindu Arabic, right? A base 10 system. Let us once again establish, right? right what the character set is. Going either way, I would still do that. Right? The table that you had before, right, namely this, is the character set, right? Now, we really did need a table for these things that were more language than they were number, all right? But when you have uh, an alien sort of base system, it sounds like a video game or an alien base, all right? You're gonna pretty much use the characters that we are all familiar with, which is the Hindu Arabic numerals and maybe a couple of letters. Now, the reason for these is because it's, we need a single digit wide character, all right, beyond number nine. So if you are in base 16, start with zero, of course. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, six seven, eight, nine. And then we would have 10, right? We'd still have to go up to 15, technically. But a 10 in our system is two digits wide. So we're going to use letters now. That's 10, right? A is 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. And we do have to go as far as F because base 16 would be up to the number 15. 
All right? 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Goofy as that is. Okay? So we have established that. Now, uh, the second thing I would do is write out the powers of 16. 16 is a zero. Even if it seems nuts, all right, I would write 16 to the zero even though you know it's going to be one, all right? So you're counting 16 to the first, 16 to the second, 16 to the third, 16 to the fourth. So you may not need that many, all right? And this is a bit bunched, but 16 to the first is 16. I'll use a different color. This is 1, 16, 2, 16. Uh, 16 times 16 is what? 196? No, 2 something. 256, I think it is. 16 times 16. 256. 16 cubed is 4,096. Yuck. Right. And I don't think 16 to the fourth I'm going to need, but hey, we'll see. 65,536. Okay, those are our powers, respectively. Of 16. Right. Let's establish, since we're going from the alien system to the standard system, and again I'm going to refer to this sheet here, this packet from way back when, the alien system to the familiar system. We identified the character set and also the powers of 10. Let's identify the number of digits. All right. Or if it was the Babylonian system, the number of groups. But for these, we're just going to do number of digits. All right? The number of digits is equal to the number of place values that we have, to, the positions that we need. That is essentially the number of powers of 16 in this case. Is it hexadecimal? Something like that. Yes, I believe so. Okay. Um, there are... One, two, three, four. So we're going to basically need four positions here. Right. Which means that it's going to be something times one, something times 16, something times 256, and apparently that part, times something times 4096. Right. What number? Um, does E associate with? All right, go to the character set here. That's 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, right? So this is going to be, since this is really E, A, E, and 1, this is really going to be 14 times that. And A is 10, so 10 times that. And then 14 times 16 again. And then 1 times 1. Right. And we will combine these. Right. Let's see. What is actually 14 times 4,096? Um, apparently, this is 57,344. which we are going to add across the board here, right? 10 times 256 should be 2,560. 14 times 16 is uh, 200 something. Let's see. 14 times 16. 224. And this is one, right? It's tedious, but We'll just add this together. Right. If you add apparently 57,344 to 2,560 to 224 to 1, you will get what this is in base 10. That plus 2560 plus 224 plus 1 is this. 60,129 in base 10. Our number 
this. E, A, E, 1 in base 16 is equal to 60,129 in base 10. Okay. Moving on. get to the algebra, it'll go a lot faster. Oh, we don't have time. Oh, it's already in. Okay. Let's claw here, console. Now, when you're doing calculations in different bases, uh, number 8, 9, and 10 are like that. Right? 10 is the most tedious, but uh, I liked uh, number 8 and I liked number 9 because they both employed um, borrowing. Right, there's a couple of things to remind you. When you add, you may have to borrow. Right? Depends on how complicated it is, really. When you subtract, uh, pardon me, vice versa, you may have to carry. When you subtract, you may have to borrow. Just remember, you borrow in the base. So in this case, um, again, I would use graph paper for this, but it's very um, you don't want to combine the wrong place values. Uh, number eight. Number eight is 600. I'm going to try to leave an obvious space. I'm going to draw a little skeleton here. This is an addition problem. It's like I'm killing it. Yeah. Killing me softly. Not really, it's pretty awful. Seven, okay. Okay. When you do the actual intricate work, all right, just do the work as if base 10. Is that faint? It is a bit. Just do your regular work of adding and subtracting, and then later multiplying, as if it were base 10, right? Then convert, right? as an afterthought. Okay? That's basically how you get through this. Right. So, in this case, I think red is probably going to be the most agreeable. If this was, you're just going to pretend, regular ordinary 6 plus 2, and yeah, there would be bases 10 here and here. It would just produce 8, right? But what is that in base 7? We have to convert, basically, even go through the exercise that we had earlier, converting from the standard Hindu-Arabic system to the alien system, right? Well, I would go through the same process, right? Establish what the character set is to base 7 so that you know that you're not deviating. You're going to have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and that's it, up to 6. All right, and then you have powers of 7. 7 raised to 0, 7 to the 1st, 7 to the 2nd, 7 to the 3rd, perhaps. All right, which is 1, 7, 49, uh, I think it's 200 or something, let's see. Here. 7 to the 3rd, 343, sorry. All right. And then we'll convert. It's tedious, but it's doable. All right. 8 is less than 49. So we're going to do 8 divided by 7, the next one. 7 fits into 8 once. 
do the subtraction. And then you have one divided by one, which is just one. These digits, which is essentially 11 in base seven, um, are what you're gonna put here. And now you're gonna have to carry. Okay, so you're gonna put a one and a subscript and then carry a one here. Right. And then you go through the work again. Right. Essentially the same process. I don't want to erase too much, so I'm going to erase just for the sake of space. That much and that much. One plus two plus six. Just do it as if it was regular 10, 10, 10, base 10, would be 9, right? But what is 9 base 10 in base 7? Nine is again, it's going to be less than 49. So what you're going to do is you're going to do 7 again. So if you have 9 divided by 7, 7 fits into 9 once with a difference of 2. And then you divide by 2, or 2 by the next one, which is 1, which is <clears throat> uh, 2, rather, sorry, 2. These digits, 12, is apparently what 9 base 10 is in base 7. So you're going to put a 2 here and carry the 1. You go through the process again. Okay. So, 1 plus 6 plus 5. Seven plus five is twelve, right? In base ten. What is that in base seven? Twelve is still less than forty-nine, so you're still going to divide by seven. Seven goes into twelve roughly, still one time, which is seven, and the difference is five. And then you have five divided by one, which is five. Now, in this case, notice that you've got to the edge, so you're going to need another column. This would be 1, 5. And this is your answer. 1, 5, 2, 1 in base 7. 1521, 1521, whichever you like, is these things combined. Okay? So stubborn. All right. We're sticking with the same process. For the sake of space, I'm going to erase this, but we're going to do our work in base 10 as we're subtracting, and then we're going to convert still for subtraction. We just may have to borrow in this case. I need this space. In this case, I'm going to just go to black. Okay, number nine. You have, I'm going to purposely leave a bit of spaces between these. Graph paper. Subtract. And you have one, one, one. These are phase twos.
1001 in base 2 is minus 111 in base 2. Again, I would establish the character set. Character set is binary, so it's just going to be 0 and 1. And the powers, since it's in base 2, would be 2 to the power of words. Fantastically. Where have you been all my life? 2 to the 0. 2 to the 1st. 2 squared. 2 to the 3rd. You're probably not going to need more than that. Right? This is really 1, 2, 4, 8. These are our references. All right, the character set and the powers of two. There is a table, you can certainly look this up, this information if you want to, but I want to walk you through the process. The first one is simply one minus one. One minus one is zero, all right? But let's do it as if it was, you know, um, you know, complicated. You know, I want to show you the intricacy because it's going to be important later, right? If we pretend that we have this situation, and I would always start that way, just regular ordinary one minus regular ordinary one, right? You know that this is zero, right? What is this in base two is the question, right? If you have zero, right, and you compared it to these powers, all right, zero would be less than one. And you would naturally divide by the next power of two. But there isn't one, right? There isn't another one beyond this. So zero is zero, no matter what, right? And it just so happens that one is also one, okay? Anyhow, you're going to put a zero here in base two. that you have a smaller number on top and then you have minus one here, right? That means that you're going to have to, at this point, borrow. Now, normally, what, what would you do? You would borrow from the column that is adjacent, but it also happens to be zero, which is like, yeah, vexing. So you're going to end up having to hop all the way over to this one, borrow from it, leave behind what would be taken, you know, the amount that would be left over, all right? But, and here's where it gets tricky, because you're doing two columns at once. You borrow in the base. So, as you're going back this way, you give two to this, this column. And then you have to share it, right? So you're going to borrow from here and leave one behind. And then nonetheless, since you're always borrowing in the base, you're going to leave a positive two here. All right. It's tricky, right? You can't just do it from this column. All right. You got to go all the way to the end in this example. All right. When you're diminishing this, intuitively go one number lower, which would be zero in this case. But when you're giving, you always give in the base, always, all right? That's why there's a two here, but you gotta keep going forward and that's why there's a two here, all right? And when you borrowed from this column for the sake of carrying over a second time, all right, um, you leave behind one. This problem is tricky, right? right? It's very counterintuitive, right? So what do we have here, right? As far as the work is concerned, we have zero plus two plus one. Um, pardon me, minus. It would be zero plus because of that there, but it's just gonna be two, all right? This is realistically two minus one. So this is just one. Okay, one, all right, in base 10, what is that in base two? 
you would go through this process again. Right? Um, one is exactly equal to one. Right? So you pretty much stuck with it. Right? There isn't another thing to divide by. Right? Right? If you did one divided by one, then it wouldn't hurt you if you did. Right? You're going to get one. So that is why right? you're going to indeed get a one here. Okay? And then you have the leftover one here and the one that was there. These two. The thing I circled in green and this that's there. If you again did the work, and we already technically did this, one minus one, all right, that would be zero. We've already established that zero is zero and one is one, all right? So one minus one, all right, is just going to produce a zero here, all right? And then there's the zero that you carried down. And that's why you end up with this. You could just abbreviate it to that, I suppose. Two digits. All right. All right. Now we do the difficult one. <laughs> the multiplication. It's. I should say it's not hard. It's just tedious. It's time consuming. This is 10 is a multiplication problem. Again, I stole these three problems directly from uh, my lab because I figured you would want to see, you know, what the intricate details would look like. Is 10, 8, 6, 4, and this is in base 12. that they are in fact faint in this case. And this is 53 in base 12. And this is a multiplication problem. Now, a couple of things. If I'm doing traditional brute force, and I should be able to, how shameful would it be? <laughs> they hired that guy! <laughs> Doesn't do things by hand at all, right? Shame, shame. I'm gonna, again, as I encourage you, put this on graph paper, all right? Especially when you're teaching them a little kid how to do this because they have messy handwriting. They should know how to do it. Like the other ways of multiplying something that is sort of mental math is an important skill, but being able to do it brute force is also, is gives them security, especially because it's very formulaic. You can't screw it up if you follow the system, right. Okay. This is eventually going to be probably that much space here. And this is going to end in probably addition here. All right. I think this is going to take a hike too today. The character set for do decimal, duo decimal, I think it is. Uh, base 12 is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Again, that would be the 10th character, but um, if it was base 10, right? But we need to go up to the amount of 11. So this is 10, really, and this is 11, really. Right? And if it's base 12, these are the powers. 12 to the 0, 12 to the 1st, 12 to the 2nd, 12 to the 3rd, and we may or may not need that many, okay? This is always going to be 1, this is 12, 144, 12 to the 3rd, what hand I don't know, 12 to the 3rd is 17, 28, and 12 to the 4th, which would probably overkill, is 20,736. 
need that as a reference. Okay. We are again going to do our work in ordinary pretend it's base 10 and then convert it as we go through it. I'm going to have to erase a lot, unfortunately. Um, 4 times 3. 4 times 3 is 12 in base 10. All right. What is that in base 12? Okay, 12, this number, is less than 144, so we would divide by the next one, which would be this 12 itself, okay. which is just 1. Okay. All right, that makes sense, right? Because if um, uh, yeah, okay, uh, I need to continue. Good. Okay. Um, this would be twelve. If you did the subtraction, you have zero. Zero, and the next one is dividing by one. One into zero is just zero. So we have these digits to work with. All right. 10, uh, one zero, basically. All right. That's interesting, isn't it? 12 in base 10 is 10 in base 12, using those digits. So I'm going to put a zero here, and then I'm going to carry. All right. Then you do the next one. All right. This is really one plus six. Uh, oh, pardon me, I should do the multiplication first. Six times three plus one. Six times three is actually 18. 18 plus one is equal to 19 in base 10. What is that in base 12? 19 is still less than 144. 19, don't be. Okay. So you're gonna divide by the next thing. You're gonna find as you go through this that you're gonna keep dividing by 12 a lot. So divide by 12. 19 divided by 12. 12 goes into 19 roughly once, which is 12, and the difference is 7. And you're going to keep going until you've exhausted the powers of 12. So you're going to go, okay, 7 is here, and then you divide by 1, which is again 7. 17 is your next one. Okay? So you put a 7 here, and again you carry. I need the space, so I'm going to erase this. Right. Um, this is going to be 3 times 8 plus 1. Just like that, oh, I should have intuitively wrote it, the 3 first. 3 times 8 plus 1 is 24 plus 1 is equal to 25 in base 10. What is that in base 12? 25, again, is less than 144, so you're going to divide by 12, the next one after it. So 25. 12 goes into 25 twice, which is 24. Difference is 1. Then you go to the next one. 1 divided by 1 is 1, and you have 21. Okay. And so you put since you've run out of combining these with 3, 21 here. All right. In traditional multiplication, you now move over one space. I like to do this. I like to put a big X just not to, you know, just sort of fill that column. All right. Don't go here, you know. You can put an asterisk. 
Um, and now we're going to go through the process of putting in 5 times 4, 5 times 6, and 5 times 8. So, 5 times 4, I'm reluctant to use blue, it doesn't have to write nicely. 5 times 4 under normal circumstances is 20. In base 10, what is that in base 12? 20 is less than 144. Um, so we're going to divide by 12. 12 goes into 20 roughly, again, once, which is 12, the difference is 8. And you go to the end, 8 divided by 1 is 8, and we have 18. So you put in 8 here, and then you carry again. I'm now doing these three. times 6 plus 1 is 30 plus 1 is 31 in base 10. What is that in base 12? 31 is still going to be less than 144, so I'm still going to divide by 12. 12 goes into 31 twice, which is 24, and the difference is 7. And then I would divide, say that, uh, 7 by 1 is 7, so I'm going to have 27. So a 7 goes here, and I'm going to carry a 2 here. Alright, bring it down. Last of these. Five times eight plus two is forty plus two is forty-two in base ten. What is that in base twelve? Forty-two still less than one hundred forty-four. So you're going to divide by twelve. Twelve goes into forty-two three times, which is thirty-six, and the difference is six. Save three. And then divide 6 by 1, which is 6, and you got 36. So I'm going to grab digits here. So you're going to put a 6 here and a 3 here. Okay. And now, you got to add these, right? Okay, the neck, right? So, 0, you're just going to carry that down, and 0 here. Right. But this is 7 in base 12, this is 8 in base 12, 1 in base 12, 7 in base 12. Seven plus eight is fifteen in base ten. What is that in base twelve? Uh, it's fifteen is less than one hundred forty-four, so you are going to divide by twelve. Twelve goes into fifteen roughly once. The difference is three. Three divided by one is three. You're going to write thirteen in that place. A three here, and you're going to carry a one. One plus one plus seven is nine. What is that in base twelve? Right. In this case, um, it should just be nine again, right? Uh, let's just verify. Nine is now less than 12. So you would divide by the next one after 12, which is 1. So 9 divided by 1 is just 9. So you have a 9 here. And that's going to happen again with 6. 2 and 6, right? Yeah. 
If you did 2 plus 6, you would get 8. In base 10, what is that in base 12? 8 is less than 12, and it's less than the base. So you would divide by 1, which is the next one, and you would get 8 again. Which is 8. And then this one is just 3 by itself, so you have that. This Thirty-eight thousand nine hundred thirty in base twelve is what this would uh, this multiplication would work out to be. Right. There is a point where this would be useful. This little fun factoid. How I should phrase it. Bear with me a moment. calculations, you can take advantage of a fun fact. I can just erase it. If you want a number, let's just go with n, is a digit less than the base. is less than or equal to 10, then this is true. The number in that base is that number in base 10. I don't think that would work in this case technically. But it is something, right? maybe to save the reference. Right? Like for example here, 8 is technically in base 12. Right? 8 is a digit 8 that is less than the base of 12. But the base itself is certainly not less than or equal to 10. So we really can't apply this in this case. I was looking for a shortcut, but I guess it doesn't work. Anyhow, this is the solution, 38,930, however tedious that is, right? We'll get in the swing of it the more you do it. All right, now, finally, having exhausted two hours worth of time doing 10 problems, um, better to be intricate than not. Let me just, um, I could go through the algebra of looking split. show you that. And while I'm waiting for this to air dry, let me get a sip of water I'll be right back and swim. At this point, uh, we're going to start with chapter 6 material. Close this and this and put this away. Yeah. Anyway. Um, you have this problem for number 11. They just want you to solve it. Part of what slows me down is the fact that my markers don't write. I wrote it uh, sort of like this typed forward slash for fraction. This is really what it would translate to if you wrote it in a more you know, fancy way, if you will. So you have a problem like this. 2 thirds times 3x minus 4. Okay. Now, there's more than one way to do this, surely. Right? And one is not better than another, except that maybe it's faster, but it kind of depends on the person, right? 
So you could easily get away with changing the appearance of this. You're going to write. Here's what you probably would do, all right? A person. They would probably distribute first, and that's intuitive, and that's a good course of action. Distribute first, all right? Realize that you have a slew of fractions in the problem, and then either do it brute force, multiplication, pardon me, addition and subtraction of fractions, and then multiplication and division of fractions. There is nothing wrong with that. There is certainly nothing wrong with that. That would work, root force works, but there's doing it with a little bit more finesse and it, you might appreciate it because it gets done quicker. Even if you distributed to begin with, which you might do intuitively, good. Right. You're gonna end up with fractions. This happens to be facted already, so you can skip doing that if you want to. Let's say that you only realized halfway in between that there's something else that you can do. 3 quarters times x is 3 quarters x. 3 times 5 is minus 15 over 4. If it's top times top and bottom times bottom. 2 thirds, these would cancel, all right? You'd be left with 2x. And then, uh, let's see, 2 times 4 is minus 8 thirds, okay? You could still go through this process now, having distributed brute force, shift things over equals, all right? Combine like terms, which is adding and subtracting. That is, combine the x's together, one happens to be a whole number, one happens to be a fraction, it's feasible. You can make a calculator do it if necessary. Bring over 15 and 4 to 8 and 3, figure out what their common denominator is, upgrade them. Nothing wrong with that. And then eventually you'd have to multiply and divide by fractions. Here's what would be the best course of action. Write an equivalent equation. Now here's the thing, it's very faint, right? Back to the cup with you. An equivalent equation is something that looks different, but has all the same relationships. How do you do that? Well, the method that you usually employ is to multiply the whole thing by the lowest common denominator. You could have done that up here earlier, and it probably would have been even more fa uh, even faster um, than distributing. But you kind of only figure this thing out while you, you, you have the experience already. So let's say that you went this far. I'm going to put this in one grand parenthesis here. If you stare at these denominators, and you're trying to establish what the common denominator is, the cheap shortcut way of establishing a common denominator would be to multiply all of the denominators, but you're gonna get a huge number if you do that. It's gonna be 16 times three, which is gonna be, what, 48? Which is not the lowest common denominator. Could you use 48 here? Yes, because it would be a common denominator, a common multiple, but it wouldn't be the lowest one. The lowest common denominator is the lowest, least common multiple of four and three, because those are the types of bases you have here, denominators. What are the multiples of four? Four, eight, 12, 16, 20, it goes on forever. What are the multiples of three? Three, six, uh, nine, 12, uh, 15, 18, it goes on into infinity. What's the first number that matches? 12 is the best choice because it is the the lowest one. Right. So, realistically, again, because this happens to be factored, you could get away with a, having done that up here, and it would have eliminated this to begin with, and this would have been one whole side accomplished. 
and this, and then when you did this side again, it would have been the same thing. It would have just eliminated this three left behind uh, four, and you would have had a lot less work. But let's say that you went this far, because I think intuitively a person probably would. Right? Let's say that you did twelve times this times this times this times this. Right? Twelve times three fourths. All right. The purpose of this exercise is to eliminate the denominator. What I do myself is I kind of write a little teeny tiny leftover adjacent to what's there, the three. As if I did 12 divide by four, there would be a three left over. That's kind of a reminder to me that I have to do three times three. If I, as long as I do this across the board, this is why I can get away with this. You could create an equivalent equation as something that looks different, but it has the same relationships. As long as you're consistent, you can get away with murder in math. It looks like I'm off of my head. Um, you can get away with murder in math as long as you're consistent. Whatever you do to the left side of equals, do to the right side. So that would be the effect here, cancellation. Also here, still going to have to multiply by something. 12 times 2 is just going to be 24, right? Um, I'll just put that little change. This is going to eliminate three, the whole point of this exercise, but you're going to now have a little four left over. Right? Now I'm going to write what it is. Three times three is nine X. Three times 15 is minus 45. 24 X is what is there. Four times eight is minus 32. This is a problem that has no fractions in it now. Right. So you don't have to go through the process of brute force, addition, and subtraction of fractions, which is even more tedious. That's the benefit of it. Anyhow, at this point, you would start performing algebra, which is to move things over equals by the opposite operations. So, um, for the sake of space, I'm going to drag this 24x from here to there where its buddy is. This is a positive, so I'm going to subtract it and subtract it. These will cancel. And simultaneously, I'll take this 45 and plop it over here with 32. It's minus, so I'm going to justify moving it by adding plus 45. This is plus 9, and that's minus 24. One of each dictates that you subtract them. That establishes the number, and it will take the sign of the larger one, which means it's going to be negative. 24 minus 9 is 15, with an x attached to it. This cancels. Again, one of each sign, you subtract them. The difference of 32 and 45 is 13, looks like. Uh, 5 minus 2 is 3, 4 minus 3 is 1. Pick the sign of the bigger one is a positive 13. All right, so what you have over here is negative 15x is equal to positive 13. How do I get rid of 15? Oh, that was in two reds. Divide by 15, negative, both sides. These cancel x is equal to 13 over 15. When you have one of each sign and you're technically dividing, you end up with a negative overall. All right, so it should be negative 13 over 15. If you had done that a little bit earlier, that is, while it was still facted, and I know you may feel a little uneasy about that, all right, this is facted because one thing is sitting in a parentheses, and as a, just a, you know, this itself could have been in its own little parentheses, it makes it more obvious that it's facted. All right. You could have pulled this trick with 12 earlier. The effect would have been this. This distributed to the first thing, since it's in facted form, it's one autonomous side now. And you'd only have to do it over here as well. All right. 12 times this 3 quarters eliminates this, you'd have a 3 left over, that's 9. 12 times this 2 thirds eliminates this, is 4 left over, 4 times 8, 4 times 2 is 8. All right. 
and h would be the 24x that you would get here. Right. The problems that follow this are two interesting word problems, 12 and 13. One says Ernie deposits $2,500 at 6% simple interest for a year. How much interest is earned? And what would the total account balance at, the, at that time? What would be, I should have typed over there, okay. What would be the total account balance at that time? Sorry, bad typing. All right. Well, this is about formulas, all right? In, uh, one of the things I uh, capitalized was simple interest. Simple interest is a formula. And simple interest is calculated from, uh, I just call it I for interest, three things multiplied. The principal times the rate times the time. If you wanted to figure out an account balance, a total simultaneously, there's this derivative. A as in account equals the principal plus the interest. Principal P is a fancy way of saying the original amount of money. R is a rate, and the rate is really, believe it or not, the percentage quoted to. T is time, and time has to be years. Okay? This is the account, the principal again. And both of those are money. This is original. This is interest. Okay. So if they're telling you that the principal, the original amount of money of this person, Ernie, at the, sa <laughs> the savings loan of Bert, you know, is $2,500. Was it 2500 Yeah. Okay. $2,500. All right. And that the principal is 6% interest, which is incidentally very hard to come by, right? Not since maybe about, I think, 12 years ago have I seen 5% interest, all right? Um, <clears throat> that's 6%. You could do 6% in one of two ways. You can put it as 0 0.06, the decimal equivalent, which I think most people would do. Or I'll show you something very practical. Be very literal. Per is this line, and the cent is 100. You'll see the advantage of that in a minute. Time was one year, so you could just put time as one. And if you like, put a one there. It's a fraction times a fraction times a fraction. The benefit of writing it in the fraction style versus the decimal style. Decimal is cool because most people probably have a calculator and that's what they would intuitively use. But you don't need it. If you're doing it mentally, this is how you would do it. Borrowed money is almost always something with zeros. So if you're dividing essentially by 100, I know this is a multiplication problem, but this is per 100 here, and this is under a line. The trick is two zeros, two zeros. That leaves you with one, 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 which is superfluous. And then one times six times 25. One times six is of course just six. 25 as in quarters. How much is six quarters? 150 cents, right? 150. So this is 150 dollars to the interest. If it's 150 dollars for the interest and it was 2,500 dollars for the principal, add these two things together, you get 2,650. It's an efficient way to do it. All right. Otherwise, just realize that you're multiplying three things: 2,500 times 0 0.06 times one. Okay. This 
is my fasted blue that will go away. <laughs> Love you, blue. Oh, um, but it just doesn't come off. All right, it writes sometimes nicely. All right, all right. The next thing is this. Chris can be paid in one of two ways. I kind of, when I was writing this, I typed it in a peculiar way because I wanted you to think of one sentence as like separate thoughts, you know, in a very obvious sense. Chris can be paid in one of two ways. Hopefully this writes. 13. There's plan A described, and there's plan B described. Okay. Put this in red. Plan A as it's described is the 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 phrasing a salary of $310 per month. I'm gonna write it out here, just humor me for a moment. $310 per month. And then it says literally plus a commission of 9%. Commission. Right. Over here it says the plan B, $556 per month. Essentially, um, plus a 3% commission. Now the rest of the question is this. For what amount of sales right, um, is Chris better off choosing plan A versus plan B? All right. If this is, and you write it, plan A, when essentially plan A is a better deal than plan B, then you might start with an inequality symbol. Right. The variable is about sales, so eventually we're going to put an S in this, right? but not yet. What I want to do is just kind of walk you through the process of taking something grammatic, grammatical English, if you will, it's kind of not really nice the way I wrote it, but take it and translate it into um, purely math symbols. It's a skill, right? A couple of things, right? The word per means either multiply or divide by whatever follows it. So if you see 300 per a month, right, you could take this much of it and write it as 310 per month. And then it would be times you know, so many months if necessary, right? Plus is that symbol that we're all familiar with. And then it's 9% of commission. A moment ago we were talking about A moment ago we were talking about the percentages from simple interest. A percent in the style of a decimal is just two decimal places, to, you know, moved over to the left. So it would be 0 0.09. Of is times, and then sales. You could write that very concisely like this. You could say 0 0.09 times S. Okay. There's the symbol because we're trying to figure out when it is, this is hopeless. What this marker here? No, that isn't bad. It's somewhat better. There's the symbol of greater than, because we're trying to figure out when A is better, basically, than B. You would do something very similar with this, so I'll write it here. In this case, the person's going to start with $556 per month, right? So whenever I see per, just even if it's superfluous, I always go, okay, that line, and then whatever the unit is per month. So it'd be times, essentially, um, a number of months, months, right? Plus is plus, 0 0.03 would be the percentage, and since it's still going to be 3% commission, 
of sales. You might just abbreviate that to be of his times, of his times, zero, 0 0.03 S, right? There's a couple of things that are very useful. So, I mean, some things are intuitive. Plus is everybody knows that symbol, right? But of his times. So whenever you see of, think of multiplication. When you see per, it could be kind of a combination of those two things, multiplication, division, right? Don't feel bad when you're trying to translate something verbal into something purely symbolic if you start out very, you know, verbose and messy, as you can see I do, all right? But what you slowly do, the task here is to whittle it down to the bare essentials. So I'm going to do that now. They don't tell us any information about months, so you have to assume it's just one month, right? So that means that it would just be 1 times 300, so it's just $310 to figure with. All right, we're figuring out for the same amount of time, no matter what. So on this side, because of these conditions of B, it's 556. And on this side, it's 310 because the conditions of A. And now you have this, 0.09S for sales, just an abbreviation. Plus 0.03 for sales, it's an abbreviation. And you have essentially, an equation that has variables s on both sides and nothing else, right? The amount of time, since it wasn't specified, eliminates out this denominator here, this word, well, anyhow, and you would assume that it has to be the same here as it is here, if it's a fair comparison. It would have to, even if it was five months, it would still event, eventually eliminate because you have them on both sides, all right? So this is the essential right here, okay? And this is the key symbol. All right, we're trying to figure out when A is greater than B. Right? So we're going to do, we're going to perform algebra as we normally would. We swap sides by opposite operations. Right? I'm going to bring point zero 0.03 over to here where the buddy is. So I'm going to subtract point zero 0.03 with an S attached. Cancels. Granted, I don't know what our... I don't know what S is, but don't panic, because even if you don't know what something is, by sheer logic alone, it would reasonably have to cancel, because it's something minus itself. And then you do it to both sides to be consistent. That means that if you did the intricate work here, you'd have what? You'd have a positive, subtracting overall, take the larger one, and this would be 0, 6. Right. It's still this symbol. Right. Simultaneously, since I brought letters with numbers to one side, I'm going to do numbers exclusively on the opposite side. So if this is a positive 310, it justifies it moving it, I'm going to subtract it. Something minus itself is 0, put it over here. Do the intricate work. Six, four, two. Okay. Now, if this is being multiplied, even if it's a decimal number, to justify isolating solving for S, I gotta move what's attached to it. So if it happens to be decimal point six, to go from here to here, I know it's moving around a lot, divide instead, point zero six, and do the same thing to the opposite side. Remember, you can get away with murder in math as long as you're consistent. So, something divided by itself is 1. It's a different kind of cancellation. Adding and subtracting is a cancellation of 0. All right? Division cancellation is 1, but you don't have to write 1. Right? So what do you have? You have sales as a number we're calculating, and that's a value, S, dollar value, is greater than, and then you could do this work. All right, 246 divided by 0 0.06. You can use your calculator or you can finagle it. If you move over two spaces to make it a whole number, you would have to do the same thing here. And it would have the same relationship as 24,600 is to 6. So if I did this basically, 6 goes into 24 roughly, well, exactly four times, which is 24. It terminates, so it's 0. 6 goes into itself once, and that, again, terminates. 
and then six goes into zero, the additional zero is twice. So you have $4,100. For the sales, the value of sales that are greater than the amount of $4,100, plan A would be to this person's benefit. Okay, the markers went flying, so I have to get them. <laughs> I'm going to do myself a favor and just throw these out now. How are we on time? Two hours and 30 minutes. Okay. Fourteen is calculating the slope. I think I might just stick with one color at this point because I, I'm, I'm taking up too much time cleaning and um, trying to get things to work that just don't. So red seems to work the best, and maybe green as well. Um, anyhow, if you had to calculate the slope, right, which is remember. Slope is basically the number that controls the incline of the line. Right? Basically, more or less, the pitch of the line. Right? And you can calculate it from two sets of coordinates. Which, if they quote uh, an ordered pair to you, just a bunch of digits normally, and then a second one immediately after, I would subscript them like so, right? And then you take them, and then you put them in this formula. Now in this particular case, what is given to you are these two sets of coordinates. Negative five, and negative one, and 10, and negative eight, I believe. Okay. If they're not labeled, I would personally label them like so, right? It's not wrong. It's not wrong if you make this x2 and y2 and this x1 and y1 if you like, but just be consistent. If, these are, if this is a 1, that has to be a 1. If this is a 2, this has to be a subscript 2. It's just a label. Right? Just insert them now, superimpose them into the formula. So, uh, y is negative 8, there's a negative in the formula. y1 is negative 1, it will look like that. x2 is 10, there's a negative in the formula, and this is negative 5. So, clean it up a little bit. When you have a double negative, what that amounts to is a positive. As long as there's no digit in between them, a double negative is a positive. Right. It's sort of like, uh, remember when you were a kid, maybe, like, I know I got in trouble with this a lot. It'd be like, uh, you know, if I was playing with matches or something, I said, and my grandmother caught me. <laughs> like, I say, I ain't done nothing, Grandma. Well, technically, that's an admission, right? Because ain't is a sort of, a, not proper English, right? But it's a, it's a negative connotation, right? And nothing is also bad English, but it's uh, also a negative. So to say you ain't done nothing is kind of saying, yeah, I did something. Look, I'm playing with matches, you know. Uh, anyhow, one of each, you're going to actually subtract to establish a digit of seven. Take the sign of the bigger one, which in this case, bigger magnitude is that. All right. Similar thing here. You have a double negative. So this is really 10 plus five. 
And this is regular adding, so you have 15. This is your slope, which is called weirdly M. Okay. All right, next one. Next one is a graph, All right? Um, dubious about pulling this out, but yeah, I'll do it really quick. If you have graph paper, and the on the test I super, I drew a graph for you. All right, and this is what you are you are working with. Right? X plus four y equals negative eight. What you want to do is rearrange this to what they call the slope intercept form. Right? That's basically this model, y equals mx plus b. Right? How come? Because this is a coordinate, whatever the d value is, and that's what you start with. And then this is the slope, which tells you where to move from there. This requires you to just manipulate a wee bit. So I'll erase this above here. Okay. If you have x plus 4y equals negative 8, draw a little table. You want to get the y alone. So you're going to scoot this x over the opposite side. If it's understood to be positive, and you would assume that if there's no sign written there, justify moving it by subtracting. And you'll just stick it over here because it, has, it can't be combined with anything. The most that you can do is sit these things next to each other. Right? If you're conforming to the model that is the slope-intercept form, you want to put the, the x portion of this in front, that term and then the minus eight after it. There is this cancels, four y is left over. Now don't make a mistake that people do, which is when you divide by four here, that you just do one or the other. It has to be each one of these gets affected by that four. So if there's again, no number here written, assume it is one, all right? And then you can simplify it. Y equals negative one quarter x, and then eight divided by four is uh, two. Okay, if this is the y-intercept, B, as we call the y-intercept, then it's the coordinate 0, negative 2. So you would go to your graph, down two increments, and put a dot at that location, 0, negative 2. When you have a slope, which is this, and it's a negative, that means down. And if it doesn't have a sign, you assume it's positive, it's right. So from this location where you started from here, not the origin, all right, you're gonna go down one and then count over to the right four, make dots maybe. One, two, three, four, make a second dot. And then connect the lines. So you'd have a graph that looks basically like this. All right, I wanna say if this was drawn on grid, which it should be, that this dot over here, which you, you're not responsible for, but if you're curious, what is it? It would be one, two, three, four, x, and then one, two, three, it would be negative three. That's 15. Um, this 18 here, pardon me, 16, is solving a system via graphing, substitution, or elimination. You could do it any of those three ways. This particular problem I would do via elimination. So that's the most complicated way. I'll just show you the intricacies of that. Anything that is a grouping of equations is considered a system, and it usually has a fancy caliper brace, and then they don't label them, but I like to. So I'm going to put this in red. 5x 
minus 7y equals negative 44. And then underneath it in blue, which I made it to regret, <laughs> 2x plus 3y equals 23. If you do this via elimination, what is being eliminated is one letter or the other. Remember that you're kind of treating this as if it was one grand addition subtraction problem. I'm going to make these little columns here to make that a little bit more obvious. But if you tried to blend together the y's with each other, they're not going to cancel. They'll, they'll sort of combine into negative 4. Right? And in this case, these would combine into positive 7. Right? So it's not getting rid of them. It's not eliminating them. What you have to try to conceive of is a number that would be sitting here and here that is opposite sign but the same magnitude. Magnitude is the, basically the size of the digit, distance from zero. You could choose to manipulate this to get the same number here and here if you want. All right, or you could choose these numbers. My instinct, and this isn't the only way to do this, is to try to finagle the x's, because I think the number would be smaller. Right? That's the only real advantage to trying to eliminate out x's in this case, rather than start with eliminating y's. All right? You want basically the least common multiple. All right? If you chose the least common multiple of five, and you compared it to two, two, four. What would be the first number that matches? The common multiple would be 10. That's the same magnitude that you want these to be, but you need them to be opposite signs, all right? So, how do you go about the process? If I want to mutate this five into 10 X instead, I would have to multiply by 2. But remember, you can't get away with doing this unless you do it consistently. So as long as you do it to all of these things, it's perfectly legit. All right, 2 times 5 is 10. 2 times negative 7 is negative 14, for the y attached to it. And 2 times negative 44 is negative 88. Same thing here. You want this to be 10 because that's the LCM, at least common multiple. What would it take in terms of the digit? You'd have to multiply by 5. Essentially, it's the opposite one. All right? But you want to make sure that it's negative. So you're going to make it negative 5. All right? Do it to all pieces. So negative 5 times 2x is negative 10x. Negative 5 times positive 3 is negative 15 with a y attached to it. And negative 5 times 23 is, I'm going to cheat now, 115. Negative 115. All right. That means that I have these equivalents, negative 10x, uh, pardon me, on top of that, minus 14, equals negative 88. And underneath it, I have negative 10x minus 15y equals negative 115. Okay, now I get the satisfaction of crossing these out, because if you act actually add these, they're going to cancel out of existence. That's elimination. What amplifies instead would be these two. All right? You do indeed get negative 29. It's just kind of a crummy number, but it's okay. It will work. I need the space, so I'm going to move here. If you combine 88 and 115, they're both negative, so they're going to amplify rather than cancel, which is 13 carry the 3, that's 10 carry the 1, is 203. All right, and it's going to be a bigger negative. Divide by negative 29, divide by negative 29. It ends up being that y is positive 7.
get verified with the calculator. Now, if you wanted to now figure out what the x value is, you would have to back substitute this 7, right? Where yeah. you could do it in any incarnation of these, but I would recommend go with the one that's the easiest problem, right? The one that has the smallest numbers, which is arguably this blue one here. So if in place of y, I stuck a 7, right? what would you get in this case then? And I will this extra gobbledygook here. You have 2x plus 21 is equal to 23, which again, you're going to go through the motions of manipulating. Subtract 21, these cancel. 2x would be left on this side, and 23 minus 21 is just 2 on this side. Coincidentally, the same digit. Divide by 2, the 2 is cancel on both sides. x is equal to 1, and y is equal to 7. Which you pair together as a coordinate, usually, which is 1, 7. nothing wrong with using substitution method, um, but I figured most people shy away from using uh, what you call elimination because it's so intricate, but it actually is very helpful, you know, especially if you take a class beyond uh, algebra, you may have to do something slightly more complicated. That's really what the subject of linear algebra is, it's what they call the matrices. This is a box with the coefficients tucked into it. Okay. Now, as to this word problem, 17. Right. Here is a, a system. Right. A system for a system. When you're doing 17, right. If you have to establish a system from scratch, when you do these word problems, like a lot of times you see something like this in a chemistry class. Here's what I would do. They're going to quote percentages to you. So you're going to establish one equation that has both percent and maybe a volume or um, a weight or mass in it. Right? That's your first equation. And the second equation will be just the volume or the weight or the mass. Now, in the case of this problem, it says that uh, soy, soybeans, wow, that's incredible, so, soybean meal is 18% protein, and I'm sort of abbreviating here, and cornmeal is 9% protein, and they want to know how many pounds, which is a weight, not technically a mass, um, should be, how many pounds of each, uh, there's a typo again, should be mixed to make 316 pounds, 360 pounds of 16%. Uh, all right. You have all the information basically, believe it or not, right? If you're talking about two things, right, let's do the, the just the volume, weight, mass equation, right? If you're talking about two things, and one of them is called soy, let's call that S, and the other one is called cornmeal, let's call that C, and they're going to be mixed, then the equation that you would have here would be the soy weight plus the corn weight equals the total weight, which is apparently 360, because that's what they mention, pounds. That's one equation. The slightly more complicated one is that it also involves percentages. So I'll put this in red. This will be soy um, times basically 19%. So I'm going to put 
19% soy, 19% S, if you will. And again, they're being mixed, so it's implying that they're being added. And this is corn, so it'll be 18% dopey. Nine percent corn, and then the total mass is again the number three hundred and sixty. When it's sixteen percent of three hundred and sixty, right. again, don't feel bad when you're trying to flesh out a skeleton that you start out more verbal and less symbolic, less mathy, if you will. All right, you're going to slowly whittle it down. All right, especially if like if you, English is not your first language, and let me just tell you, English gets me as a teacher in trouble all of the time. Right, because of its conflicting sets of rules. Don't feel bad, right? You gotta just go slow. Right? Let's convert what we can. Right? 18% in a practical way is 0.18. So now I have this. 0.18 times S. All right? Plus, because again, it's a mixture, it's implying that they're being added. 9% is 0.09. So now it is this, 0 0.09 C, and now 18, uh, pardon me, this is equals. This figure, 16% of 360, which is again very sloppily written, just to superimpose it and make it a little more visible here, clean it up. 16% of this times, all right, so this will be 0 0.16 times 360. This figure that you end up with, when you multiply those, is 57.6. So I'm going to make that dark. 0.6 pounds. Right? That's what that translates into, eventually. The one advantage to teaching on a whiteboard or something like it is that you can get away with erasing stuff like this. I like to superimpose the changes because then you see that it's in it's filling a void. It's filling, it's doing a job. It has a certain position in the equation. So that's what you would whittle this down to, all right? And the one that is underneath it, I'm just gonna erase this junk. Everything that you need is already there. All right. Now, in this instance, um, I would not say that elimination method would be the most practical way to do this. What I would think to do is basically substitution method for solving a system, which is basically to stuff one equation in the other. But you have to isolate one first, isolate a variable. So I'm going to solve for S by moving C over here. And that would entail subtracting C. I think people, because there's less numbers involved, a lot of times they talk themselves out and go, ah, I'm not allowed to do that. No, you are, all right? You are allowed to manipulate things. As long as you're consistent, all right? Subtract, subtract. S is left over. You would have S is equal to this not so meaningful equation yet. But look what you get. S is equal to an expression rather than a satisfying number, but we're getting closer to the satisfying number. When you perform substitution method, you take the half of it, that is the expression, and you stuff it in the other problem, in the other equation. So you're going to put it in here with this an S. So what do you get now? If it's 0.18 times 360 minus C plus 0.09C equals apparently 57.6 from multiplying, now you're good to go. You just gotta basically clean this up. Right? Distribute, distribute. 0.18 times 360 is apparently 64. 0.8, 18 times C is negative 0.18 C. That happens to be plus 0.09 C here, and this 57.6 is still remaining. All right. 
what I would do is combine what you can, which is like terms here. And what you end up with in that case is one of each says you're going to subtract. This is going to shrink down to 0 0.09 coincidentally with a C attached to it. And it will be negative because of the larger magnitude. So now you have 64.8 minus, and there's still this 57.6 here. All right. Now, do the, the algebra. Shift stuff around right, to solve for C in this case. Minus 64.8. Minus 64.8. These cancel. All right. You're left with negative 0 0.09C is equal to, this is going to be a negative as well, 57.6 minus 64.8, because of the larger size negative is going to produce a negative. As for the digits, um, what do you end up with? Negative 7.2. You are now going to isolate C to solve the C by dividing by 0.9 both sides. These cancel. All right. If you were going to do this by hand, you would move two spaces and then move two spaces. And the relationship of 7.2 to 0.09 would be the same as 720 is to 9, which is 80. The negatives cancel. That means that the corn weight is 80 pounds. All right. Save that. If you want to find the soy weight, it's back substitution which you'll get stuck doing anyway. 360 minus 80 means that the soy weight is going to be 280 pounds. Okay. Um, for 18, uh, which is solving a quadratic equation by a specific method is what I recommended. Right. You could, in theory, use the quadratic formula for both of these. 19 is also a quadratic equation. I would encourage you not to use the quadratic formula only for the reason that it's sometimes more trouble than it's worth. So when you have a problem like 18, and you're trying to solve this, and it looks like so. 32v squared plus 20v minus 3 equals 0. When you have an equal sign, you know that you're solving an equation, which is essentially finding out what the v's are. In the case of something that is degree 2, expect two answers even if they're the same answer twice. Good. Okay. As far as methods are concerned, I mean, I recommended that you factor it and then use the zero product rule for the reason that it was already arranged set equal to zero. So if you can get this factor, then there are some problems that you can't factor. Though that's when you really use the quadratic formula, when you can't factor something, but this will, then you could easily use the zero product rule. Right. Now, what you should try to do as far as methods of factoring are concerned is try, in this case, AC product pairs. This is your A, this is your C. If you multiply them together, you would get AC product 96, all right? And then we will try to consider pairs of factors that make 96, and there'll be quite a lot of them, all right? You nonetheless want to go through the motions of figuring out every combination pairs, because that's going to help you progress with the rest of this, okay? 
always start with the easiest one. It's going to be one and then the number. All right, that's one choice. This is even rules of divisibility, so it would be apparently 2 times 48. If you divide 96 by 2, you get 48, so that has to be a factor. Some of the digits would be uh, 15, so I could use 3. That's the rule of divisibility for 3. And if you're wondering what I'm referring to, I believe I gave you that a while back. Somewhere in our papers, I gave you a list of rules of divisibility. So if you're a little sketchy, then I would encourage you to look at that. Let's see, let me put that. Oh, here it is, right in front. These are the rules of divisibility. All right, which you can't have every uh, multiplication table memorized, but you can infer, you know, from the rules of divisibility what the factors would be. Rule for three is the sum of the digits, which would be 15. Does 15 divide nicely by three? Yes, so therefore this would. If you divided this by three, you would get what? Three goes into th nine three times and goes into that 32 apparently, all right, which is what it came from. All right. Four, you'd have to test it out by brute force division. Four goes into this twice with one left over, it's 24 apparently. All right. Five is, does it end at a five or a zero? Mm -mm, can't use five. Rule six is, does two and three work? Yes. Then six would work. All right. Six times, let's see, one with three left over is 16. Uh, seven, you'd have to brute force divide it. Seven goes into nine once with two left over, it wouldn't work with seven. Eight times 12, I know this is a multiplication table, but there is a rule of divisibility for that which would require you to divide it anyway. And then nine itself, nine wouldn't work, all right? These are your choices, right? For what? You're taking this thing in the middle and splitting it into either a sum or a difference. Right? Meanwhile, this is sitting next to you, and this is sitting here, and this is still equal to zero. You decide which of these choices would work to sit here and here based upon the sum that you are looking for, all right? If you maybe add or maybe subtract one and 96, there is no way you're gonna reach 20. You're gonna get either 97 or 95. So you would eliminate that as a choice. Same thing, too far, uh, too, uh, too far away. This would be 50 or 46, all right? This would be 29 or 35, too much, all right? These two, if you added them, would be 28. But if you subtract them, it would be 24. Save that one, that might be the best choice. All right, run the gamut, check the other ones. Six and 16, if you add them as 22, that's not 20. And if you subtract them, it would be worse. So that's not gonna be it, that would be 10, all right? This one, if you added them, all right, would be 20. So there's a possibility as well, all right? But ultimately, I'm gonna decide which one to go with based upon the signs sitting around here. It's very likely that I'm gonna to need to employ subtraction if there is only, there's somehow a negative in this thing. So it's probably gonna be this one, not that one if you test it. Which means it's gonna be 24V minus 4V. That would be positive 20 as long as this is a positive 24. Okay? Next thing, you're going to now sort of put the blinders on and just factor two things at once. That's the, this is called factoring by grouping, what you see now. Factoring by grouping is for four term wide polynomials. And that's what this half of the equation is. It's a four term wide polynomial. It ironically is easier than trying to factor three terms, even in spite of the length of it, because you really only need to pay attention to two things at once. These are both made of the letter V, so that sits outside of parentheses. This is GCF factoring, sits on the outside. And if you know your multiplication tables, you would recognize 32 and 24 from tables of 8. 8V times 4V would be 32V squared. 8V times positive 3 would be 24V. Now, what I would do is start with the negative here, and let's see what we could factor also in this case. 
Um, the G, this is made of one, two, and four, and this is made of one and three. The GCF in this case is just one. Negative one times four V would be negative four V. Negative one times positive three would be negative three. And what you're hoping would happen did, that is that the junk sitting in here and in here are exactly the same. They have to be exactly the same. The, the terms have to be the same. The signs have to be the same. If they're not, then it means it's not factorable unless it's perfect. The way it fact is, is like this. This match gets its own parentheses. And the stuff that's on the left and on the outside, what I call personally the left outs, they get their own parentheses. And this is still set equal to zero. So I'm going to superimpose this. The match written just one time is 4v plus 3. And the left outs in this case is 8v minus 1. Okay. Now, that's the factoring portion of this. If you want to use the zero product rule, I need the space. I'm going to write it here. This is now established to be 4v plus 3 and 8v minus 1 equals 0. Because it is equal to 0, you can take advantage of the zero product rule. The zero product rule is giving a name to something that you already know. That 0 times anything even if that anything is a binomial, is equal to zero. So you split this in two, and you try to figure out, all right, well, this will, if this maybe, 4v plus 3 is equal to zero, I can figure out what v is. If this 8v minus 1 is equal to zero, then I can figure out what this v is. So I'll do that. Move 3, cancels. 4v is equal to negative 3 divided by 4. v is equal to negative 3 fourths. Okay. In this case, move 1. 8v is equal to positive 1 divided by 8. v in this case is equal to positive 1 eighth. Now, if I were a good sport, I would go back into the original equation and verify that both of these are correct, but I'm pretty sure that they are, and the process is really what you're trying to learn, whether those are extraneous or not, and I don't believe they are. They wouldn't be. Okay. Right. Two more. Next is, you rec I recommend, you didn't really need to do it in this case because it does factor, solve by the quadratic formula. It's going to work when something is factorable and you actually go through the process of using the quadratic formula, it always ends nicely. Right? If something is not factorable, you potentially get something that's kind of annoying. Here's 19. All right? If you're going to solve this by the quadratic formula. Right. You end up with, what is it, x squared minus 3x minus 18 equals 0. All right. It's an equation, so you could solve it. It's a quadratic because it is an exponent of 2 and 3 terms, and um, it's in general, pardon me, it's in standard form, which means that it conforms to this shape. We need to establish that this is the first coefficient is 1, the b value would be negative 3, and the c value would be 18. We can then insert them in the quadratic formula, which is this. Negative b plus or minus the square root of 
b squared minus 4ac sitting on top of 2a. In a good and an odd uh, twist of fate, uh, the faintness of this will be helpful. I'm going to basically superimpose the coefficients of negative, pardon me, positive one, negative three and negative 18 into this, right, in its relevant places. So it would be just because it happens to be here. There's a negative in the formula. So what I always encourage people to do is draw uh, parentheses around the letter. And then just so you know that you are not just forgetting that there's a negative in the formula, but this is also negative. Right? Simultaneously, when you're squaring something, that negative is also going to be affected by the two. So if you put a little pocket here that you're going to fill the void, it will make sure that you don't make a mistake. A is in two places as well. This is one, and this is one. And then C is negative 18. You are to follow the order of operations when you do this, which would end up dictating you pay attention to the guts under the radical symbol here. So you're going to really deal with this first. It's known as the discriminant. That is the guts that are in here, the inside. It will ultimately dictate whether you have a totally real thing, and in this case you will have a nice regular number two actually, or if you have something that's complex, and complex means that it has a, uh, an imaginary chunk part of it, you know, term. It's not going to be imaginary in this case because you're not going to get a negative here. Anyhow, negative three squared is negative nine. All of this stuff multiplied is going to be positive four times 18 is 32, carry the three is 72. that I duplicated that correctly, right? Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, it's positive nine because of, uh, my man, I'm taking that advice, a negative times a negative is a positive. All right, that means that in our next little line here, we're gonna have this. We're gonna have a double negative is a positive three, plus or minus the inside guts of this, are nine plus 72, which is just 81. And this is sitting on top of two times one, which is two, that is really faint. If you whittle this down, what is the square root of 81? That is, it's gonna have identical factors that you only write once, all right? And it would be nine. So you're gonna have positive three plus or minus nine, sitting on top of two. That is a much better green. If this is my crummy green, no, that kind of works. And that also kind of works. Um, this is what X is, all right? In one instance, you're going to add nine, and then in in the other instance, you're going to subtract 9. So if you do 3 plus 9 over 2 versus 3 minus 9 over 2, the reason that you have this stacked plus or minus is because in theory it could be negative 9 times negative 9 that makes positive 81. All right. In this case, you end up with 12, and in this case, you end up with negative 6 on top. What does that mean? It means ultimately that your answer is either 12 times 2, which is 6, or it's negative 6 divided by 2, which is negative 3. Those are your two answers. All right. The very last thing is just to tell graphically whether something is a function or not. And the simple test for that is the vertical line test. So I'm going to draw very quickly a graph right here. If you have a graph that looks like this, y, 0, x, and you have what appears to be some kind of sideways parabola shape, like this, the vertical line test says if you draw a vertical line, imaginary, through this graph, 
Ask yourself, how many points of intersection are there? How many collisions would there be? Red on green. One here, one here. If it is come on, more than one point of intersection, it fails the vertical line test. And if it fails the vertical line test, it means it is not a function. So in this case, this graph is not a function. Right? The reason why a person would care is because in pre-calc and other, other upper levels of math, um, in order to create an inverse, you have to have a function. Right? Inverse is another graph. It needs to be a one-to-one -one function, really, to be. It has to pass the vertical line test and the horizontal line test, which is another thing you're not responsible for. Where is my marker? It just went into the void. Oh, here we go. Well, that's it. All right. Um, put that there. That's crummy. That's getting thrown out. And this doesn't even function either. Okay, so basically, those are the solutions to test number one. I already gave you credit for it. How does that affect your grade? It helps. I already got 100 for a test grade. It's 25% of your grade. All right. Do beware. Your homework counts for more. I know that the situation is normally reversed. All right. But we're on remote instruction here. So if I can't proc to something, well, it didn't make sense to me to, uh, uh, to make it count for that much. All right. Your homework, you're doing for the experience. This test, you're doing for the experience. You are preparing for the practice exam, right, for you, you to be a teacher. So um, do take the time, all right? And I know that you have this as a reference. As long as you understand my explanation, and I hope that I was intricate, you know, then you're better prepared for your exam, okay? As for test number two or three in the final, I'm not making any promises, all right? If I can somehow figure out how to make a test that I can proctor, securely, all right, remotely, then I'll do that. But I might not, all right? So do your homework, <laughs> all right? It's the most important thing, genuinely, okay? Be careful out there.